my plan is to uh, hopefully make this very conversational as we go um, through. So I have some slides and some demo material, um, but please do feel free to um, speak up and ask questions um, as we go. Um, and uh, as I go through this, I'll give a little bit more about my background too and um, uh, perspectives on things. So uh, obviously I'm from SEEK. Um, I'm gonna be talking about how we approach um, machine learning and driving value in the um, process industries. And so I'm not talking specifically about one industry, but really um, if you look at uh, SEEK, um, as a company, our customer base spans oil and gas, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, food and beverage, um, materials, uh, um, metals, mining. Uh, so it's really a wide variety of different types of um, process industries. And they all have one thing in common. They have time series data that they're collecting with a number of sensors um, that, that are monitoring various bits of equipment and operations and all that data um, is getting stored. And so in order to derive value from that data, the first thing is we need to ask some of the right questions of that data. And here's some of the types of things that folks in those industries are asking. Um, it could be as simple as why did something happen? I had some upset in my process. Um, I had a compressor fail. What caused that trip to occur? What caused that, caused that unplanned downtime? And so how do we begin to do root cause analysis and figure that out? How do I figure out when did something similar happen multiple times in the past? And can I draw some conclusions on how I'm gonna change things going forward? Um, we might also ask questions about what is happening right now? Um, taking our historical knowledge of the process, let's actually monitor ongoing operations so that we can give real-time advice to those that are out in the, um, on the manufacturing floor, out um, in our operating environments. It could also be um, from a descriptive, uh, just what happened in general, in particular, as we really think about driving value in our um, uh, various process industries, it's about um, sharing insights about what's going on with the operations so that way people at appropriate levels, whether that's an operator, an engineer, or different levels of management understand what's going on. And then of course, we always want a window into the future, predicting what's gonna happen, um, being prescriptive about how we should operate um, going forward. So these are the types of questions that folks want to ask of the data. And um, we have many different ways that we try to go about this. But I wanna talk a little bit about what are the challenges that actually come into play when we think about answering those types of questions. And to me, there's three main categories of what needs to come together and um, work in order for us to be successful at answering those types of questions and then being able to, to deliver value as a result. And so the first one is data access and cleansing. So at the heart of doing any analysis, we need to have access to that data. Um, it'd be great if that data was um, all perfectly aligned, it all existed in one data source, we could easily get at it. The reality is we oftentimes have um, maybe our main um, sensor data is going into an on-prem data historian. I also might have lab data that's going into a different um, a data source. I might also have um, maintenance information about when I had different downtime events or other maintenance things occur and yet a different data base. And so how do I get access to all that information? How do I bring it together understanding that not every piece of information is sampled at the same frequency? How do I align that? What do I do when I recognize that data inherently is messy? It's noisy, it has um, uh, gaps in it. How do, I, how do I handle that? So as we face this challenge, we're gonna need to think about how we access our data. 
The next um, piece of the puzzle on the lower right hand corner is the algorithms. What are the different um, analytics, um, machine learning uh, algorithms and tools that we're going to bring to bear on this problem that we're going to apply to the data? And so how do we integrate that in? Um, Oftentimes, we'll, um, we can have data science teams and machine learning engineers who have some really great different tools at their disposal, but what does that look like to integrate with the data? And then finally, really at the heart of the matter, um, and this is where I relate to this, um, is the subject matter expert, the um, folks that are on the front lines that understand what's actually happening in their facilities. They're the ones who know inside out how their compressors function or how their um, distillation columns work or how the um, various operations are occurring. They understand what are the different tags that are important pieces of data. They have contextual information from being right there next to what's going on and understanding it. And so um, bringing to bear that knowledge that they have and putting it into this um, puzzle. When um, I think about and reflect on my time um, at ExxonMobil, I was there for uh, just over eight years. I was in their research and engineering organization. So I was in their central organization supporting refining. And a couple observations and just life experiences um, there was I could be in the central organization. I could come up with a really good um, model or a uh, um, tool to describe and, and guide how uh, they should be operating out in the refinery. Um, but if they didn't have a good understanding of why that guidance was being given, if they didn't have a window into what was going on, it was very easy for those in the refinery to disregard any of that work or what guidance was coming from um, those various um, models. Uh, there. And so um, to me, it's how do these different pieces actually fit together um, so that we can uh, provide the greatest um, value. So with that, um, a little bit about SEEK and how we um, fit into this picture and what do we bring. And so um, there's kind of three pieces, as you can see here, to the SEEK solution and what we think about. The first is connecting to your data anywhere, any type. If we look at um, a number of different companies out there that are doing machine learning, uh, one of the first steps oftentimes is they're gonna say, we need to actually copy that data into our system or make a separate copy. Uh, with Seek, we're going to actually leave that data where it is. Um, you've already um, made the investment to store that data in a location. And I'll show you in a moment, um, but we're, able to then just connect in and have a live connection to these data sources where we just index what's available and then access it as needed. And as I mentioned, there's those different types of data from the actual process data, what temperatures, pressures, flow rates do we have? There's that business data, potentially what are, um, uh, what is the maintenance that's happened or other custom data sources like that lab data or um, maybe weather data as examples. And then um, the heart of SEEK is what we call SEEK Cortex. And this is our um, analytical engine. It's um, a server-based application and it can actually run both on-prem or in the cloud. And this is where we're going to actually perform our various analytics and machine learning um, calculations. The end user is going to then experience Seek through one of three different parts of our application. Um, and this really allows us to speak to different parts of the workforce. Um, so um, starting with, there you see in green Seek Workbench, this is where we're going to be having typically our subject matter experts, the um, our process engineers, for example, are going to locate their data, cleanse that data, contextualize that data, perform analytics. Then we have our SEEK organizer in blue. This is where we're going to 
create reports and dashboards that can then be shared out potentially to operations or to management to make visible those results. And then the third part is Seek Data Lab in orange. This is a um, Jupyter Notebook Python-based um, environment that's going to really extend the um, analytical capabilities that we have in Workbench and what we're doing with Organizer. And it's going to, um, you'll see, uh, we'll paint a picture of how do we bring together these different groups within our, um, in our company from those subject matter experts, process engineers, to operations or management, to then also our data science teams. So I'm gonna pause for a sip of water and just see any questions about um, just setting the stage for what we're gonna talk about and how Seek is, is structured. Is this, I guess, quick question to the group, first time that you're hearing about Seek or seeing it, um, interested in that? First time. I've actually used it before uh, collaboration with a pharmaceutical company. Okay, excellent. Excellent, excellent. So, um, well, my um, next slide is actually to go into a demo because I think it's always more exciting to see things than just look at um, pictures on a, um, and I'll zoom in a little bit there so we can maybe see it a little bit better. Uh, look at screenshots on PowerPoint slides. And so this is um, Seek. Uh, I've um, connected to it through my browser here. And this is the home screen when um, someone comes in, they can actually come in, they'll see uh, things that they've recently been working on. They might have things that they've pinned here that are of importance to them. We're gonna take a look at and as I mentioned, there's three parts of the application, starting with just Workbench. What's it like to come in and begin to do analysis? And so if I open up a new Workbench, up comes um, my blank Workbench. I'm on a data tab. I'm ready to begin my investigation. And for this, as I mentioned, Seek's indexed what data is available. So I can come in here and I can actually um, take and type specific tag names. You'll notice here I used a wildcard and search for and find data of interest. Um, in this case, I've brought in um, my feed rate. I might also know that there is um, maybe a temperature signal that's of interest. So I can search and look for that data. Um, you'll note up here that I actually have multiple data sources connected to Seek at any given time. So that um, allows me to access really data from those different locations. Uh, once I have this data on the screen, I can take and I'll expand the time period here to seven days. I might actually wanna bring it out to a month. I may decide to actually zoom in and we're gonna look here. So just an easy way to begin to move around and view um, my data. So are now, you, I'm sorry, just a quick yeah. question. Are you caching that locally? You said you always pull it from the source, but it's obviously responding very quickly. I just was curious on how you're doing that. Yeah, so we do have um, some smart caching going on. Um, we have, Basically, there's two types of caching. Uh, for the response you're seeing right here, we um, have a short-term cache that allows this to happen. We also have the ability actually to um, turn on, if I come here, the caching. Um, so on that Seek server, we're storing all the data. Depending on what our data source is, we actually find that performance can be, um, for example, if you're working with data from OSI Soft Pi, performance is really responsive, so you don't need to um, cache all that data. But even when we cache it, we're still always connected back to that, um, that data source, so it's not truly a separate copy. So great question. Um, so I've brought up my data. I've started to move around in time. I can step to different time periods. Maybe I want to go back and look at what was happening um, in 2020 or um, that I can I can move around. 
Um, where Seek becomes powerful, though, is when we start to actually do analysis and not just view it as a trending tool. And the idea when Seek was first put together was to really speak to those um, subject matter experts, for example, those process engineers who understand that data and give them ways to begin to really interact with that data, different from where they historically were, which is often Excel. Um, uh, during my time at ExxonMobil, um, so many different Excel spreadsheets because it's just the most universal tool for people to, to easily get into things. Um, so as we're looking at this data, a couple things that I might think about when I'm looking at it. One is you'll notice my temperature signals noisy. And so providing here, for example, I'm gonna take and I can do some cleansing. So I have some cleansing tools. Maybe I wanna do some smoothing and I'm gonna call this smooth temp and I'll select my temperature. I have some different algorithms here that are built into Seek um, that I can use. I'm gonna go ahead and use this um, Seek Agile here. And you'll notice I'm already previewing my smooth signal. Um, Seek is about visual analytics, so um, it's gonna respond and I can use that to then determine you know, how much smoothing do I wanna apply what do I want to do from a data cleansing perspective? And here I'm just going to overlay those. Uh, so that's an example of using Seek to do some data cleansing. Uh, furthermore, um, I might want to identify, I had a flow rate here, and you can see our operations go on and off in this particular process. So I might want to identify whenever I actually have flow occurring. And so I'm going to come in here and go to identify. I'm going to do a value search and I'm going to call this um, operating and I'll look at that uh, feed rate here and we'll see whenever that feed rate is greater than 0.1 so as long as we have a little bit of flow and I'll hit execute and you'll see that some bars come up here and seek language this, these are capsules and they're identifying um, whenever those flow events are occurring and I'll zoom in a little bit more one thing you'll note in this particular example, um, it looks like maybe we have a leak in the system sometimes. Maybe I don't actually want to include this data in further analysis because this isn't when I was actually operating. That's just a small leak. And so built into Seek's tools are easy ways for engineers to come in. And here I can take and say, you know what, maybe I want to ignore any of those capsules, these short little events that are less than 30 minutes. And so if I hit execute there, you'll see those events go away. So very quickly with a couple little wizards um, uh, in a very visual manner, I'm able to come in as a process engineer and begin to work with my data, filter it down to what are those events that are of interest to me. And this whole while, as I'm doing this, I have knowledge of the process because I understand this really doesn't represent flow. It doesn't represent anything important. And so I'm putting in that understanding to my data as I begin to, to look um, and work with it. So there's a variety of different tools here. We looked a little bit at um, cleansing, identifying periods of interest. We have some um, built-in tools here for doing some model and prediction. So regression analysis right in Seek. Um, but my... Um, focus today, one of the things I want to touch on is what, um, what does it look like, as I said, to really collaborate across the organization and um, be able to have that engineer who's come in and, and put their thought into some of this cleansing and analysis, then share this potentially with um, the data science team who's going to do additional work um, on this and maybe provide me uh, some results that can help me predict what's going to happen in my process. And so, as I mentioned, we have another um, part of the application here called Data Lab. And so this is our um, Jupyter Notebook uh, Python environment. And I went ahead and um, opened up a new uh, Data Lab here. I'm going to just go ahead and create a new um, notebook. And I can simply do, um, here I'm going to do a spy.pull. And 
what my engineer may do is they've created this analysis. They then can take this URL, um, share it with um, that data science team, take and put it in here, and I'm going to do um, execute that. And you'll see that that data now comes into Python here, already gridded up in a nice data frame. So it's ready for me to um, do uh, my various analyses, model building that I may want to do um, on it. And so as I've interacted with various um, uh, data science teams that are customers, um, just this ability to leverage um, these cleansing tools in Seek, being able to get that knowledge and expertise there, and then so quickly get it into that already gridded data frame that's ready for me to now use for further analysis is, um, is really powerful. So I wanted to just start off this demo showing you just from scratch how easy it is to actually go through and, and click some of these things and, and do that. Um, the next bit of this demo, I want to uh, actually take you to um, an example and show you um, what uh, that full picture might look like. So any other questions on just this first part of my demo? Yeah, back on the um, workbench, what are some of the modeling and predicting things that you have? Yeah. So um, in here, we have three things right now. Um, boundaries, this is really just a visualization tool that um, uh, fits in here. Um, uh, the two that are of interest here, reference profile and prediction. Um, prediction, this is going to take, and actually, if I click under advanced here, you can see the different regression methods that we offer in SEEK, so ordinary least squares. Um, principal component regression and ridge regression um, are available right within the tool. Um, there's some neat features of how we have this in here. For example, you'll see limit to condition within a training window. This means I could come in, for example, and quickly limit to only use data when I'm operating in a given time period, um, which is nice. And then um, uh, we provide all of the various um, Regression statistics from that. Um, uh, the reference profile here, this is actually doing um, just a statistical calculation, calculating plus and minus um, certain standard deviations, really around batch type activities. So how something evolves over time and allowing you to compare it. So those are some tools that we have built in here. And just a quick preview to what we're going to talk about um, in the second part of this conversation is how um, data science machine learning teams can actually integrate into Seek to expand the, the capabilities here. Um, I, I have one quick question. Yeah. How does the, can you talk a little bit more about the prediction method? Um, if you go back to that, if yeah. you open it up again. Uh, yeah. So is this used to predict future sensor or future sensor data? Yeah, so it can be used to do and let me actually um, I think I have up here. Uh, so this is actually a seek organizer topic. Um, and I have several different types of um, seek analyses on here. So one of them here, a uh, heat exchanger, um, that heat exchanger is fouling over time. So its performance is going down. Um, so we've modeled that um, degradation and we've actually done a couple different models here to then forecast out into the future, what point in time are we gonna hit a minimum operating threshold? Uh, so that is one way that we use the model and predict tool. Um, that prediction tool also can be used um, as a um, soft sensor. So in this particular example here, product property monitoring, um, we're trying to operate our unit to meet a certain viscosity target. Um, 
The problem is to know what viscosity we're producing, it requires taking a measurement, sending it off to the lab and waiting four hours for the lab to come back. In the meantime, we could produce off spec product. And so this is actually using that same prediction tool I just showed you, taking and saying, okay, let's look at our operating conditions, predict what that viscosity um, would be so that our operators can be adjusting the process. Um, real time while we wait for those measurements to come back from the lab. So those are a couple of examples of um, how it's been used. So does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. How much input does the user have in order to choose which inputs go to the model? Um, so like, are you just feeding it in all of the data for the past month from all of the different sensors or yeah, so um, if I take and I'm going to actually click um, on this here and I'm going to go edit source worksheet because um, we're always attached back to where we actually created um, these analyses. So I can come in and I'll hit edit here on my predicted viscosity um, signal. Give that a second to load. So here's the prediction tool for this particular one. Um, so our uh, engineers decided they're going to model viscosity. Um, they're going to do it as a function here of um, reactor conversion, flow rate, temperature. Um, this you can put in as, as many input signals as you want um, here. We don't limit you. But then you'll see here, because we actually have the model set up, we get information then about that model that they can use to determine um, what should be left in there, being able to look at the p-values, what's relevant, um, being able to uh, see our various regression statistics um, there. So yeah. Um, so it is real quick, that signal to model then is a separate signal that uses the what you're trying to predict? It's what it's uh, regressing it against. Yeah, so the result of this, um, uh, when I hit execute this new um, signal here in purple, that's the, I'll make this um, stand out here. So this is actually the um, prediction. It's not, um, so historically, this is showing me what's predicted by that model, not what is the actual value. That occurred at that point in time. Um, and then our actual data is our blue line here that we were trying to match. Any other questions on this? A little bit of a tangent from where I was going to go, but um, I was happy to, to um, uh, show that. And I guess while we're here and we're just looking at this example, um, I'm going to click over to this journal tab because uh, this is an important part of SEEK and how we're doing our knowledge capture and um, collaboration. So these questions, for example, you had about how did you actually make this or what steps went into cleansing the data? Um, this information can be documented right next to where we're doing the analysis. And one of the powerful things about it is it's not just a written documentation, but there's actually these embedded links in here. So I'm able to click on something and now I can see exactly what were the starting signals that that engineer who did this analysis started with. Um, I can see here that they actually, it mentions they used the delay function um, as part of their data cleansing. And so um, in this case, uh, the idea was to um, take into account the known residence time between the reactor and then where we actually sample the viscosity um, from. And so I can click in and I can see, oh, they've taken, they've shifted this by 1.5 hours based on their knowledge of, in this case, how the um, uh, process operates and is set up um there and so you can actually see these different steps we can see where they did the agile filter for actually smoothing that data before we get end up going into and creating um, our model so it's really about this connectivity where you saw me go seamlessly from 
my final report, but I'm actually tied back to, as you saw, where that analysis was created. And then ultimately I'm tied back to the data source. So I can actually step to current time and Seek is gonna automatically calculate what this is for um, right now, or I could step back to any time period in the past. So it's this powerful seamless connection um, of all of the, the pieces from data to final report. Um, there. So that's an example of um, one uh, uh, tool and just how our um, end engineers are engaging uh, with Seek. Um, I did have queued up here, and I'm just going to show this one um, uh, fairly quickly, uh, with that idea of how do we collaborate, say, with that data science team. So in this particular example, I have some vibration data for some bearings, and I want to be able to predict when are these, um, when am I going to have a failure? And I actually had a failure right here. And so I know that my vibration is going to increase as I get closer to that failure point. Um, and so our engineer, they can come in and they can use Seek to um, cleanse that data. So they may be identified when we had some periods of abnormal operation that we want to exclude. And so they've actually excluded that data. They're also going to identify periods maybe of normal op operation here. Um, and you can see, I'll just show you real quick. For example, here's um, a Seek formula where they've said, you know, after a maintenance period uh, for that 32 hours, we know that we're going to have normal operation um, in what we're doing. And so being able to put that information um, into the data. Now, just using the tools that are available here um, within Seek, in this case, they actually went ahead and created a, um, a statistical threshold here, just looking at what is the um, average um, and standard deviation of my vibration data during normal operation. They can then use this to um, monitor against. You'll notice that we've created a capsule here once the vibration exceeds that threshold. And this might be sufficient enough for that engineer to say, okay, let's actually just continually monitor against this, um, this threshold that we've calculated. But this is where we also may say, let's engage our data science team and take um, a closer look. Is it possible for us to get even um, more advanced notice so we have more time to coordinate with maintenance, make sure that we're gonna have parts available, make sure that we're gonna be able to handle the downtime. And so um, in that case, um, what we've done is that um, engineer is able to, um, as I mentioned and showed in, in the first part of the demo, take and share uh, this um, workbook with that data scientist. And then they're gonna be able to come over into their, um, into Seek Data Lab in this case, and actually take and, here, use the SPY library. Here, they're actually going to do use SPY search to search for any of these bearing signals, um, pull in it, the information about what data is available, um, and then do a SPY pull to actually load that data, just like you saw in my first example, here into that data frame. So that now they're able to start with that cleanse data. Um, they're able to take and pull that data specifically during normal operations. And we've just plotted it here so you could see the data that they're gonna use and then begin to do their modeling. In this particular case, uh, that's developing um, an artificial neural network to understand what's happening um, with that data. So we go through some steps here of training that model um, and then applying that trained model to um, new data. And so if I scroll down, the interesting chart right here is this one. Um, through the creation of this artificial neural network, they've made now a bearing status signal that when it's zero, that means I have um, a normal operation. When it's one, that means I have some abnormal operation. Now, the powerful part of this is I'm not gonna have my engineer come in and be looking at my Python code or um, that. Um, instead, what I wanna do is use spy push 
to actually take and put this data right back to where, um, where our engineer is working and engaging with the data. And so I'll click on this work step and you'll actually see that this um, bearing status signal is now here, right in that same environment where my engineer is already comfortable working, already engaging with the data, able to validate this against other things that they, they know. And indeed, this is in this particular case giving us um, a bit more advanced warning than just our statistical threshold. So part of it is to illustrate this use case, but really what I want you to get out of this is thinking about the workflow and how we engage between our different teams that work in different types um, of environments. Um, a little bit more on that. I'm gonna go back to my slides. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, do you mind talking just a little bit more about that bearing status model and how it was made? Um, so, I can't take credit for actually um, uh, creating this uh, neural network model. So I'm actually not gonna try to answer that, those particular questions. Um, another uh, colleague on our team um, was the one who went through and did that. So, sorry, I don't have those details to speak do, to. Do you have any idea what even approach was taken? I mean, we probably see it here. You see you're forming the layers. Mm -hmm. Okay, it would take too long to figure out the structure here. And that. Sorry. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, apologies. I can't speak to that in more detail. Um, so what we really saw in this demo, it's about how do these different pieces come together? How, do, how is the flow of data between different groups of people? And um, you saw uh, when we looked at that um, uh, Jupyter notebook that what really enabled things was the SPY library, SPY standing for Seek Python um, uh, module. And the, um, one of the things that's um, powerful about SPY is it's actually not um, unique to working just in the Seq data lab environment as we really think about um, engaging with um, data science, machine learning. We want to be open to any and all different types of um, libraries and modules that are out there for doing um, different analyses. And so you can actually use the SPY module in a number of different environments. So for example, in Azure Machine Learning um, or um, Amazon SageMaker uh, locally in Anaconda. So it's um, that way to be able to um, engage with, um, with that uh, Seek workbench and where our, our engineers and operators are. And I had just a couple slides here. I wasn't gonna actually demo this, but just to illustrate further, for example, instead of the process that I just showed you in Seek Data Lab in that Jupyter Notebook, here, for example, um, Azure Machine Learning model creation, the idea that um, Seek Cortex, that's that calculation that's um, engine that's tied back to our data sources. Um, and so then being able to use that SPY module here to um, pull that data in so that we can actually um, train that model, develop it, being able to push those results back so that you can see them in Seek Workbench. And then of course, once you're here, you can also be um, doing your archiving, versioning data sets and your model and, and what you're doing. And then you can take and actually begin to operationalize that. Um, you can look here and think about um, actually um, deploying it where it's going to then run um, regularly. Um, in this case, instead of pushing results directly back into Seq, we may push them into another data store. It really depends um, on what you're doing, but then making it available for that um, end 
uh, engineer to engage with. So uh, in the demo, we looked at doing it through Seek Data Lab, but I also want to illustrate that really this power extends beyond that um, environment to um, meet people um, where they're at. Uh, so in the first part of our, our conversation, we've looked at subject matter experts applying and sharing their knowledge of the process as they, they do initial data cleansing and working with the data and analysis. We've seen data scientists that uh, could create in that example, their artificial neural net, share those results back to um, our subject matter experts. Um, in the last bit of our time together, what I wanna talk about is really the next frontier of where Seek is going on how we think about um, taking data science and making it approachable and available um, to those process engineers, um, subject matter experts. And that means actually, how do we think about sharing not just model results, but actual algorithms or various user interfaces that people um, might engage with. And so when I think back to my time at um, ExxonMobil, I think back to a number of um, little different one-off applications or um, different things that would be made to target uh, something. And then you'd have to, okay, I pull this up and I have this thing installed here. I pull this up if I'm gonna do something else and install it there. And so what does it look like to actually make this cohesive um, ecosystem where it's really seamless for that, that subject matter expert to um, engage? And so- um, Before you go, I can I ask you a question? Yeah, so go for it. Uh, we saw two examples, one where you have like a pre-canned model, basically a pre-canned model within your system mm -hmm. the, that's, you know, mostly set up for you. And then yep. you have basically another, another workflow where you're taking, you know, you may be defining some additional, you know, features, but you're, you're building your own model and then pushing it back into the system. Mm -hmm. What do you find that your customers are interested in? Like, do, do, do the data science teams want you to build your build? Like, do they want pre canned models or do they want to build their own models uh, overall? Yeah, yeah. perfect, uh, perfect uh, intro to this slide that I actually have up okay. um, here. And it's this um, spectrum here you can see on the bottom of going from guided what we can call no code low code types of analytics and ml all the ways to very script based open the floodgates of anything i i want to do programming wise um, type analytics and ml and so over here you can see um, built-in features to workbench here's that prediction tool that we talked about where you know it's it's um uh pretty much no code and what you saw in that tool panel that was put together to make it very easy for folks to um, engage with. And then as um, you were saying, uh, we saw then the other example where we went to, okay, now I'm out in the world of Python. I have access to any algorithms that I wanna do, but I need to have the skill set to be able to work with that. And so um, both of those are things that um, we see uh, customers um, doing and using, but we also saw that there was a need for something that kind of fit in between those two. And this is where um, we'll spend the, the last bit of our time together is talking about what we call our external calcs or tools. And it's really bridging between these two places of folks that um, feel comfortable working in this space and wanting to make different things available. Um, to them. And this piece is what I've found um, data science teams are getting really excited about because it's it's one thing to push some final results back. It's another to think about how they're really going to actually engage with the end users and, and empower them. And so there's um, two different ways that we can think about it um, in Seek or that we've approached it in Seek. One of them here, um, I call it data science teams sharing algorithms with engineers. And so the idea is um, for them to develop any algorithm they want um, uh, using any set of Python libraries and then making it what we call an external calculation in Seek. 
And so then our engineer is going to be able to actually access this and seek workbench. Um, in this example, what we've actually done is you'll notice this is my bearing status. We've made here our um, Python script where, excuse me, um, we're actually calling this through our external calculation. And now our um, engineer is in control of what inputs they want to put in here, being able to apply it to any asset over any time period. And then this will execute and return results. And I actually um, wanted to just uh, illustrate this um, briefly, what that looks like. So I'm going to take and come back here and um, just add a new worksheet. And I'm going to pull in um, here, I have some weather data. So I'm going to pull in some wind direction, uh, wind speed, um, and we'll maybe look at a little bit more data on here. So um, in this particular example, I'm not, um, uh, this is more just a complex uh, calculation to illustrate. But the idea is, um, I want to calculate what is, for example, my average wind direction. I can't just calculate that um, straight up because um, I have to be mindful of the fact that um, this is um, in degrees. And so um, what does that look like to do that calculation? And so here we've actually made, um, so Seek's uh, formula tool, I've taken and made what I call, if I, oops, if I can spell and search for it, I've made some weather functions. You'll know that these here, um, package installed by uh, Krista, so I put it on the system. This is me making some sort of advanced calculation or model or algorithm available to end users. And so they can come in and say, oh, you know what? I wanna take and calculate the average wind direction. Um, the documentation for this um, particular algorithm that I've put together or calculation um, is available. Uh, it shows up just like any other types of seek functions here. And then we can come in and I'm going to just say, here's my wind direction. Um, and this is going to be a function of uh, days. So let's calculate a daily average. And I'm going to actually use that second one. And so this will be weighted based on the wind speed. And so I'm going to call this daily average um, wind direction. And I'll hit execute. And so this is calling that separate piece of um, Python code or whatever that I've made um, and executing it. So it's a way for that data scientist to actually put things right in the hands um, of uh, engineers here to engage with, be able to see that documentation. And the powerful thing about this, now instead of my data scientist having to um, have set this up, make sure that it's running on a schedule, make sure that they've backfilled any historical data that needs to be there, because this operates just like any other seek function. That means I can take and step to other time periods. I can come to the current time period. Um, the weather data from NOAA actually gives a forecast here into the future, so I can see what that looks like. So it works just seamlessly like anything else that I'm doing in Seek. Um, but it's allowing that data science team to say, oh, I have my own IP that I want to make available and not just what Seek already provides in the solution. And then in a similar vein, um, I had one more. This is my last um, example for us to talk about today is actually um, user interfaces. So it's one thing to have just a formula there with some inputs that go into that formula, but there might be something that's a little bit more complex or how I want to engage with them. And so um, again, this is um, here, we're using Seek Data Lab and it's any Python libraries. It's allowing any IP that you want to put into it, making that available. And now we're going to actually make it a tool in Workbench. And when it's a tool there in Workbench and then it's going to go execute in Seek Data Lab, Instead of just returning a new signal like you saw with that external tool, we're going to actually be able to do a number of different um, things with that. And so my last example here, um, 
I have some data that I've pulled up. Um, again, I'm going to expand this and just pull in a little bit more data. But I'm going to go to my tools panel. And in here in my list of tools, there's a section called external tools. And under external tools, um, there's a number of different things. I'm going to open up this one called correlation analysis. And so this is actually popping up. You'll see this is Seek Data Lab. Um, what we've done is our, our um, data science team has put together um, this little user interface um, in their Jupyter Notebook and put it into app mode and it pops it open. Um, what this does is we're looking at um, a correlation matrix here and we actually by default have some time shifting on. So Seek is saying, how should I shift those signals relative to each other to maximize the correlation between them? Um, I have some different um, options in here. I can view, for example, um, this color based on how much signals are getting shifted relative to each other. Um, I can also view this in a table mode, for example. So I've created this whole um, new experience for my um, end user to engage with their data in. And not only am I seeing some different visuals that aren't necessarily native in Seek, but this can then, um, in this case, I can say, let's create these shifted signals. So before I go do my predictive model, maybe I want to um, maximize the correlation between my signals. And so I can come in here and say, you know what, let's shift everything relative to my temperature signal. And so I'm gonna hit create. It mentions that those signals are now in workbench. If I come back here, I now have a new set of signals here and it says, for example, compressor power aligned to temperature. I can hit edit and it's created the necessary seek formula, in this case using the move function and then that um, offset there that it calculated to maximize that, um, that correlation. And so um, taking really that, how do you engage with the end users to that next level by making these interactive um, tools and seamlessly putting them um, into, um, into Seek. And so that's something that um, from within Seek, we have, um, in addition to our main software development team who puts together and, and builds this, um, this whole application, we have an applied research team that actually has several data scientists on it. And we're using this external tool function, um, as you can see here, to experiment with a number of different things. Some of them um, we may actually feed into the core product and actually have our software developers make a formal part of the product. Um, other things, it's experimenting and learning from our customers and, um, and working with them, but we've opened it up such that it's not just Seek building and putting Seek IP into these things. It's okay, let's have a customer who has a data science team do that. Or let's have a customer that may not have a big data science team, but has a partner that they work with. Or there might even be um, other third parties who ha say, you know, hey, we have some really interesting algorithms. Um, what's an easy way to connect that um, with data? And so creating um, this environment to really make it flexible for how you think about doing machine learning. So instead of Seek coming in like other a uh, number of other, for example, ML companies do and saying, you know, we have some specific algorithms, use this, we'll do service hours and we'll help you set it all up. Um, we're really thinking in terms of what does it look like to um, allow, um, you know, anyone to be able to contribute and, and engage. So that, um, that pretty much brings me to what I wanted to uh, cover and share. And um, my last slide here was just to highlight um, what we've talked about and, and the different ways that we're seeing these groups um, interact together, um, the ability to incorporate in um, different, um, different use case and algorithm um, IP. And so with that, um, I just want to thank you. I hope this was uh, interesting and um, useful. I know that we only have two minutes left. I'm happy to stay on and um, if there's any more questions, um, answer those. Um, but if you're interested, uh, 
please do. Um, you can reach out to um, me or info at seek.com. Um, there's more to come in our machine learning story and what we're doing in that space. Um, uh, we're probably going to be having a webinar and, and some more announcements and things uh, June, July timeframe. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time today.